Pray with me as we gather today. Lord Jesus, we are gathered in your presence. Faith formation leaders from across Mennonite Church USA and our friend and guest from Rwanda, we are here today to talk together about what we're learning about intergenerational faith formation. So Jesus, this time is for you. Our ears are open. Our hearts are open for what you have for us. Speak to us today through one another and by the power of your Holy Spirit, energize your church and energize these leaders for the ministry that you have for us. In your name we pray, amen. All right, our guests today are gonna answer some questions about their experiences with intergenerational ministry. So um, let's just begin with Melissa. And I'm gonna ask each of you to go ahead and introduce yourselves and your ministry contacts before you share with us today. So Melissa, will you get us started? So um, my name is Melissa Spolar. I'm the Minister of Children and Youth at Pasadena Mennonite Church in Southern California. Um, so I'll share briefly about our church's aspiration to be intergenerational. Um, you know, I think in general, all of us agree that it's important for our growth to use our gifts, to give space for others to use their gifts, um, to make church a space for all development levels, um, not just adults of similar ability levels. And I think in a lot of ways, we are, we are doing some good things in that, um, but I would not say that we've mastered it. Um, we still can be a little bit segmented. So I really plan to just share a few things that I feel our church does well in being intergenerational in what we do. Um, a couple things that we've tried recently that have worked well, um, as well as some of the challenges that we've faced. So I think what we do well at Pasadena Mennonite, um, we really do try to encourage people of all ages to get involved and to use their gifts. Um, we have a high schooler that helps run our Zoom tech. Um, we have high schoolers and even sometimes junior hires on our music team. Um, we really do try to encourage uh, that it's the, the spaces of volunteering and service and using gifts is not just for adults. Um, our small groups are also uh, integrated. You know, in a given small group, we might have a married couple, a single person, a young family, a teenager. So we don't organize those by life stage. And I think that really helps, um, yeah, crossing those bridges and in real deep conversation. Um, and then our mentoring program that we do. So every time our junior hires um, come into sixth grade, we match them with an adult member of the church. Um, and that stays in, ideally all the way through high school. And so that really helps develop a deep bond and get more adults involved in youth lives um, beyond just youth group. Um, so I think where we've probably faced our challenges is in actual services. Um, I think, again, as much as our church aspires to be intergenerational, we have had issues sometimes with people feeling like kids can be disruptive anytime that they are in the main service, um, which during the summer and once a month, we do have kids stay in the main service, primarily due to a lack of volunteers. But we also think that it's, it's good that they get exposure to being in the service and not just all of a sudden in sixth grade. It's a you know huge transition. Um, because we don't offer junior high and high school programming during service. And so we do think that it's good that they're getting some exposure and getting used to that space and helping us to remember that we all part, we're all we all part of one community. Um, so I'll share two things that I think have worked well when we do have kids in service. Um, I mean, in general, we're, we're trying to rethink what it means to um, yeah make our services more accessible to different development levels. Um, a couple summers ago, we actually had a guest speaker that came in and did a series that was, it was like a godly play sermon series. Um, so if you're not familiar with godly play, it's where you do a visual storytelling from scripture, typically with like little wooden objects. Um, and we just got really lucky that, you know, this guy who did our, our five week series in this was really talented and gifted and leading this very visual, engaging, um, it was actually through Song of Songs, believe it or not, which probably wouldn't come to mind as something good for kids, but he just 
he did it really well. And I think honestly, um, I don't think anyone minds visual, right? I mean, we're all just made for storytelling. And so we, yeah, we all just really appreciated that the kids were engaged, like they were actually listening to the sermon that doesn't happen often. Um, so we've just really been trying to lean into being as visual as possible in sermons. I always try to include PowerPoint, you know, pictures, videos. We're going to try to experiment more with godly play in sermons if we can. And then the other thing that we've been doing um, anytime they're in service is in the week ahead, I reach out and figure out, you know, what the passage is, the sort of theme. And then I prepare clipboards for all of the kids that have pencil pouches, colored pencils, sharpener, um, and then there'll be sort of a, a service following guide. They can write notes about the sermon or words they don't know or their favorite song of the day. And then I usually do coloring page, um, you know, word search, things like that. And so um, that really helps them to have something to do while they're listening along to the service. And so that, that has gone well. Um, I will stop there because I'm over my my time, but those are the things that are working for us. Wonderful, thank you so much, Melissa. And let's hear from Laura next. Hey, right, thanks. My name is Laura Nafziger. I'm a pastor of Faith Formation at Assembly Mennonite Church in Goshen. Um, and I would just say, in addition to the things that Melissa does, what I'm gonna to talk to you about are three things that we've done during this COVID time that have been kind of uniquely COVID. Um, so one is that we have had, um, we, we usually before COVID had a worship hour and then a second hour, which is when we had our Sunday school time, but children were present through the whole first hour and then we go to Sunday school. During COVID, we haven't had those two separate times. And so that's when we've really tried to figure out, okay, how do we keep everyone together all the time? And um, so one of the things that we tried was we did um, cluster worship groups in people's backyards. Uh, we divided people by geographic area where they lived in town. And we provided like a, a bin. Um, uh, it was a lot of work ahead of time because we had, it was a seven week series and we did, we had all the seven weeks of material ready for everyone to take their bin home. And it included like, a candle and the little offering basket and any materials you needed for the whole week. And then there were three, we heard the word in three ways um, in each cluster group. So every cluster group did the same thing, um, but they were doing it in their small uh, home-based groups. So they heard the, the word in three ways. The first was like a scripture story, um, just hearing the scripture. We used the new um, Shine curriculum, which has the new Bible that I can't think of what it's called right now. Anyway, um, so we use that new one. And then the second way was with a picture book. And the third way was with like a 200 word adapted essay from the Christian century. So we had like three ways to access the story. And then the groups talked together about what they heard. And there was also a responsive prayer action that everybody could do together in response to hearing the word three times. And there was some music and things. So that's the first thing that we did. The second thing that we did was very different. It was a, a Lenten practice. It was um, through all the weeks of Lent, we had stations set up at the church that were like prayer stations that people could come and go uh, as they wished on a Wednesday evening. And then we had someone there offering some kind of ritual, uh, anointing, communion, uh, a blessing of milk and honey, uh, a wisdom, Sophia blessing. Um, there was a ritual each week uh, in person, like tangible ritual that you would receive the elements, but it wasn't always communion, but like something like that. And then there were six stations that adults and children could come together. You could come as your family group or as your small group or however you wanted to come and access them. And there was always an art station. There was always a music station, uh, like a praying with your hands station, a Bible text in like five translations, reading the text station. Uh, we were using the leader material. So there, it, there was something about like earth or sky or water or whatever, so whatever the thing was for that year. So those were uh, individual uh, pr Lenten prayer practices, but that were created for everyone in the congregation to access. Uh, and the third one um, that I wanted to tell you was just um, something that we had, a, a 
pattern, a ritual practice of doing a fall lantern festival that was always done for children. Like children would come and they would make lanterns and they would sing and um, it kind of had its life and it was really popular. And, um, and what we did right before COVID was we did a really nice switch where we have a lot of older people living at the senior center Greencroft in our town. And so we took the lantern festival to them. And so we did the singing and the, and the sharing together. The kids went from apartment to apartment and then we shared cookies together. That was right before COVID. And so then during COVID, what we did is we all met outside and we brought each, everybody brought a little baggie of two cookies and then you swapped your cookies with the, another <laughs> person. we had a cookie swap after we walked um, around town and sang with our lanterns. So everyone was invited to come and we did, we ended up doing the lantern festival right before the election. So it was kind of a prayer lantern festival with cookie swap. So those are three very different things in our worship service, uh, extracurricular, and then like a, a family thing. So there you go. Thank you so much. And next, Zach. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, my name is Zach Martinez. I'm the pastor of Sojourn Mennonite Church, and we have a location in Greeley and Co Fort Collins, both in Colorado. Um, so I really started thinking a lot about intergenerational worship in response to uh, a divide that was taking place in our church between people who were older and young families. Um, our church was founded by people who were retired and it was basically made for people who were retired. Um, and when I came on, it was about, I guess it was about six years ago, the church really wanted to grow among young families. But one of the things we realized was that that made, meant that we had to make some changes in the way we were doing things. Um, and so it was sort of in response to one experience that I had. We had the biggest fight that our church ever had was changing our worship time to be one hour earlier to accommodate children. Um, and that was the, and I, this is not a joke, it was the most painful conversation we've had and people actually left the church over the decision to move. And so one of the things that I realized that the fears that were being expressed in those moments were that people were losing um, an awareness of their place in the church and how, um, how the church would fit them. And, and this is mostly people who were a little bit older. Um, they, they've perceived that shift towards a focus on young families as a way of like sort of like their their role in the church was over and like and now it was going to leave them um but one of the things we've been realizing is that if we actually begin to center the formation of children we actually create really specific roles for people all throughout the church especially those folks who are older um most of our young families are transplants and so they don't have families around but once we start to center um the faith formation of children then all of a sudden they became like surrogate grandparents. And that became a really important role. And they became really, it became really clear that they still had a really important part in the church. And so all of a sudden, once we started centering children's spirituality as the, as the thing that we were going to focus on coming out of COVID, so this is mostly at, at the end of COVID, we, um, we realized that people were actually getting really, really excited about um, being a part of children's lives and being able to tell stories of their own faith formation in the context of children and be those kind of like surrogate grandparents um, and sort of bring this wisdom of long faith stories uh, to kids who are like four and five and things like that. Um, and so some of the ways that we've been doing that is by having children's, we have a children's time in our, in our service and that's kind of the main um, sort of like children's ministry have right now. We're still a really small church and we've had, we've gotten smaller during COVID. Sorry, I feel like I'm talking really fast, but I'm trying to get everything in in four minutes. Um, but one of the things we've been started doing is doing combined activities. So after children's time, the whole group does an activity together. So this last week, one of the things we did, um, we had a family that moved away during COVID and we didn't get to really say goodbye to them because it was sort of in the height of the surge in our area. And so we all wrote, we talked about how we are a community still, even though they're far away and how we can still care for them, even though they're far away. And so the kids started, got to make pictures and we're all gonna mail their pictures, but then the adults wrote letters to the families. Um, and so they all kind of like got together and we're doing this thing together. Um, and they really got to feel like they were all part of one church. Um, and we're gonna keep continue doing that where we have a children's time that leads into an activity that the whole church gets to do together. Um, and then we also have 
um, invite the older group, the older folks to come and during the children's time, share stories about their faith formation. Um, stories like when they were a little kid, what they've learned and how that's carried them through their life. Um, and so far that's worked pretty well. Um, we're only a few weeks into trying to really focus on that. Um, but it does seem like some of the temperature has been brought down a little bit in some of those conversations around how we're going to do outreach and like who we are going to like target in our outreach. Um, so that's kind of where we're at in that. Um, and I'm over my time now. So <laughs> but, thank you. Thank you, Zach. Oh, that, that was all very valuable. Um, yeah, and thanks to Melissa, Zach, and Laura. All very interesting and valuable things to hear about. 